We welcome you. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I'm sure before the conference is up, we will we'll be able to find out where you're from. But we welcome you. But everyone, friend, I can't, I can't stress to you the importance of it's an individual thing. God's going to touch your life. We are so certain of this, regardless of what you've been through. And John Kilpatrick, myself, and the ministry team here, we don't feel like we have anything as far as I don't feel like I'm uh, anybody. He doesn't feel like he's anybody. We feel like most of the stuff that's happened in the survival we've stumbled upon. You know what I'm saying? We're just a couple of simple people. But one of the things you'll find in us that is unquenchable is our hunger. Okay? We crawl into this place every night believing that God's going to touch us again. And that's why I believe he continues to move. Charles Finney made the statement. He said, revival will end when the people involved in the revival don't go after revival anymore. It will end. And we go after revival every single night. I believe that any night God could anoint me in a more powerful way. Any night, any time, any moment, God could do the same for you, ma'am. God could do the same for you, sir. It could happen tonight. So how many are open to God? I know you are. I know God's going to move mightily in this place. Jesus, we thank you for what you've already done. We thank you, Lord, for encouraging us. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We bless you, Jesus, for your presence. We thank you, Lord. Well, I want to introduce something, somebody to you, that, and this is, this is something that a lot of folks don't know. It's John Kilpatrick and I have known each other for 14 years, and uh, I remember Pastor being 6,000 miles away in Argentina, broke, dead broke, going through the inflation, which no one understands until you live through it, what inflation's like, where a bag of cement went from $3 to $15 just overnight, and, and food went from where you could buy a meal for a dollar, suddenly it went to $25, a loaf of bread goes from 50 cents to $3, just, just incredible inflation. And I remember calling John Kilpatrick every single time I called you, brother. And most every time you were not at the church, you were at the, your home studying. And Rose would give me his phone number. Now, missionaries that are here, you know, they never do that. They give you the pastor's home phone number. And I would call pastor at home. And every time, pastor, you don't know what it meant to talk to you and to hear you say my name and say, I love you, we're standing with you, brother, and I never had to hem-haw about money. You would ask me about finances, and I'd always say the same thing, I'm broke. <laughs> and, <laughs> you need to just open it up by saying, hey, Steve, how much you need? <laughs> you know. But uh, he was always there, and, and I remember, and he, he really, when we first went to the mission field, I'm just, I want to brag on this man because I love him so much. When we first went to the mission field, he didn't know me from Adam. And my wife and I were at a hotel in Mariana, Florida, Holiday Inn. And we were at the beginning of our mission career, and we'd been raising funds, and we needed to raise $25,000. And I'd built this little stupid little pyramid out of bricks, okay? And you'd buy a brick. You know, there were $100 bricks on the bottom, $200 bricks, and it would go all the way up to $25,000. The top brick was a $5,000 brick, okay? And most of the pastors, you know, they bought the $100 bricks, you know, and God bless every $100 brick buyer, but... I needed some five, I needed a five thousand dollar brick bot, you know, and I walked up to John Kilpatrick, and it was a corny little thing, okay? You, you've seen him, Pastor, just a missionary trying to raise his money, and I went up to John Kilpatrick. I said, "Here, I got this pyramid of bricks," and uh, and I said, "I need your help," and he goes, "I'll take that one," and he he got the five thousand dollar brick, and he turned around, he wrote me a check right then and there. That's another miracle. <laughs> he wrote me a check for five thousand dollars. And he said these words, and I'll never forget them, brother. You looked at me, and you said, I believe in you. And that was in 1984. Yeah. And we have grown so close over this revival. And people ask us, do we have spats? Do we get along? We just plain old get along, friend. I mean, you can get along with an evangelist. You really can. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> But we enjoy this revival, and I want everyone to welcome to this pulpit John Kilpatrick.
Thank you very much. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you. Well, you know what I'm tempted to do? I come in here tonight, and for some reason I took weak, and I almost fainted out in the hall when I came in. And they prayed for me back in the back. Brenda, you know I was not well when I came tonight. They prayed for me back in the back. And uh, Mike said, Lord, when he gets out there in the sanctuary, just let him be revived. Man, that music started up, and my soul, my soul told my body, you better shape up, boy. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk for the first time without my walker. was a first, believe me. We're not trying to put on any uh, display of sensationalism, but I got in here and I got to feeling so good, I just sat over there and said to myself, well, I'm going to walk tonight for the first time without any aid. I fell, as you know, six weeks ago, and we won't talk about that a lot because that's just old stuff, but I fell and I broke my pelvis in four places, and I tore my pelvis away from my spine back here in the back. And the doctor told me originally that I would be about six months before I would uh, before he'd let me put any weight on that area. So I was down flat on my back and couldn't get up for three weeks. And um, when I first went to the hospital, my wife came in and saw me, and I was so bloated and swollen because when I fell, I fell 14 feet, and I'm six foot two and a half, almost six foot three. And you take that height on top of falling 14 feet, that's about 20 feet. And um, I fell right in between some steps. I have a house under construction, and my, my steps going up to the second floor. I fell right in the area, right in between the steps. If I'd have fell two inches over, I'd have hit my head and my neck on those steps. And they had just moved a saw, a table saw, with an exposed blade where they'd been sawing rafters. It was laying right where I fell. And um, when I fell and hit the floor, I remember so well, I, when Steve gets up and gives the altar call night after night, I usually come up here and stand behind him as moral support, but I also want to see those souls come to God. And I come up here and stand behind him, and I always hear Charity singing Mercy Seat, and I always hear Steve with that godly passion in his voice calling those sinners. Many nights I'll search my own heart. I'll stand here behind him, and I'll say, Jesus, is there anything in there? And uh, I remember the night, the day that I fell. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It was on a Wednesday. And when I hit that floor, I remember I was falling. But I, I remember it was so sudden and so scary because I've always been the type of guy that I've always been in control but I lost control. I had no control. I was falling. And immediately it felt like I went to hell because I was blind. I couldn't see. And I had pain go through my body that felt like liquid fire. I knew I wasn't in hell, but it felt like I went there because I was blind, couldn't see. I was falling and I felt fiery pain. One second I was normal. The next second it felt like I was in hell. But as I lay there on the floor, I remember screaming out, I've fallen, I've fallen. And I was screaming in pain. The pain was liquid. And the doctor said my pain was so great that it, it, I lost my sight. And my sight didn't come back till I was in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. I didn't know if I was going to be blind. When I fell, I bit my tongue and I had blood all in my mouth. And I thought I was bleeding internally. It may have been. When my wife got to the hospital and saw me, she was with Ken and Lois Gott that day, and 
Whenever they finally got word to her, she came in the emergency room, and there I lay, and I was so bloated from where I'd fell. I was swollen. And they said that I'd tore my liver, and they said that I, I had ruptured my spleen, and I dislocated my kidneys. And um, whenever I fell, it felt like I tore everything loose in there. But I remember people were coming in, and they were praying for me. And uh, even as I lay on the floor before they moved me to the hospital, I remember Steve's voice going through my head. And he always gives an illustration, and he said, if we were all on a plane headed to Los Angeles, and, he lost, and the plane lost both engines, and the plane was going down, he said, and you knew in just a few moments that that plane was going to crash and everybody's life would be lost. He said, if you were on that plane, would you worship or would you pray? And as I hit that floor, I examined my heart and I said, Lord, I can worship because as far as I know, there's no sin in my life. And I remember I began to worship the Lord. I, th I thanked him for my boys. I thanked him for my grandsons and my daughter-in-law, my wife best wife a man could have. I thanked him for my church that he gave me to pastor. And um, about that time, God always has the right person at the right place. And there's a Pentecostal pastor came in. He worked with the volunteer fire department. And he came in and he said, Brother Kilpatrick, you don't know me, but I know you. He said, can you move your legs? And I, I moved my legs. And he said, can you move your hands? I moved my hands. And I remember he put a hand on my back, and he said with the sweetest voice, like the voice of an angel, he said, you've got no injuries you will not totally recover from. And I remember those words brought me such comfort because I, I couldn't see, and I was in terrible, terrible pain. I couldn't get up. I tried to get up off the floor. That was impossible. But I remember in a, in a state of such um, insecurity and fear and pain, I felt that hand on my back, and I heard him say, Brother Kilpatrick, you've got nothing you can't fully recover from. And I went out and got in that ambulance, still couldn't see. They helped me in the ambulance. And on the way to the hospital, I began to see things dancing in the top of the ambulance, and it was my sight coming back. And that man's words brought me such comfort. And as a pastor laying there, another man of God ministered to me. I got the opportunity about three or four weeks later to thank him and put my arm around him and tell him, you don't know how much you mean to me because your words meant so much. The purpose of this pastor's conference is for hurting, scared, insecure men and women of God to come into a place like this and for us maybe just anybody out of this audience can put a hand on your shoulder a word in your heart and say to you don't worry everything's going to be all right and I want to tell you friend tonight I'm not running for office I wouldn't take office if I could get elected, which I couldn't. <laughs> but I'm not running for office. Don't want an office. If I ever quit pastoring this church, I certainly won't be going to elected office. So I wanted to explain to you I have no ulterior motive in what I'm going to say. But I want to say to all of you here tonight, pastors and evangelists and spouses, that we really truly love you. You'll never know how much we love you. That pastor's banner that came out a while ago was not my banner. That was a banner that God gave me for pastors all over the world to pray for them. That was not my banner, in spite of what some people have thought down through these pastor's conferences. That was a banner that I made up because I love pastors and evangelists and workers in the church and the fivefold gifts of the ministry. And I love you. And I know what you go through. My wife knows what pastor's wives and the females in the ministry goes through. Steve knows. And the only motive that we have of being here night after night, it's insane to go night after night like we do, beating our bodies and uh, putting our bodies through the kind of excruciating 
rigorous schedule that we have for two and a half years of revival now, but the only reason we do it is because we love people. We really love people. We have no ulterior motive. God knows that with all the things that's happening in Brownsville, I have never one time felt it. I don't feel that this is happening in my church because it's not my church. This is just the church God's let me pastor. And these are not my people. These are the sheep of his flock. And I'm just an under-shepherd that he's given me charge over them to shepherd them. And so I want to tell you that we love you. We know that many of you are wanting to go after God. You're hungry, but some of you are a little afraid because you're afraid of what people back home will think and what they'll say. I understand that. We also know that many of, you, many of you have come here with a notebook and a pencil and you want to make notes and you want to take notes and do it just like we do it here at this church and go home and try to make it happen back home. That won't happen. Because let me tell you, this pastor's conference that we're hosting, there's nobody going to come behind this podium and take this pulpit and this microphone that knows how to have revival. We haven't learned how, and I hope we never do. We only come in here night after night and just say, Jesus, would you do it one more time? One more time. And friend, everything, as Steve said a while ago, that works, we've stumbled across it. But I remember two things in particular, and I'm going to sit down in just a moment. But I remember two things in particular that happened the first week of revival. The Lord gave me a word, and I had to learn how to receive words from God all over again because I'd gotten burnt out on prophecies that never came to pass, and I'd gotten burnt out on people that gave prophecies that lived like the devil, that was gossipers, adulteresses, adulterers, those that looked at pornography, those that watched HBO, Showtime, Cinemax, and yet they wanted to come to church and prophesy. I got so burnt out on it that I had gotten to the point that I'd fulfilled Scripture where the Bible says, despise not prophesying. I got to where when one would come, I'd cringe. And I had to learn to receive all over again from God. But I remember, too, that came the first week of this revival. God mightily touched me the first day of revival when it broke out on Father's Day. I won't get into all that right now, but he touched me in a powerful way. I've always been a man that uh, has been resolute. When I make up my mind, my mind's made up. I've always been a pastor that um, you don't get too much on me. You don't get too much by me. And if you start acting up in church and I felt like you was in the flesh, I'd set you down in a New York minute. I would not let the flesh dictate and control. But when God got a hold of me on Father's Day, I began to see things just a little bit different. I've always went after God, wanted God, wanted revival, was raised in a Pentecostal church, powerful Pentecostal church, and my pastor was an old German man, R.C. Wetzel, mighty, mighty man of God. Such a mighty man of God. And he was real. One of the shocks that I faced when I got out in the ministry was I found out in the ministry not everybody was like my dear old brother Wetzel. And it was a shock to me and a letdown. But my church was Pentecostal through and through. My pastor was a true man of God, solid as a rock, balanced, but yet he was really holy. But the first week of revival, I remember a message came in tongues. And the interpretation said this, and, and in revival, you might be surprised, 714 services tonight. This is our 714 service of revival. And um, you might be surprised, you might think that messages in tongues would come every service. But they haven't. We don't let anybody in this revival give a prophecy or give any kind of uh, interpretation of tongues unless we know them. And if anybody here has a word from God that they want to give to us, they have to go through their pastor and get it approved, and he has to tell us that they're a tithe-paying member in good standing. And then... We'll listen if the pastor approves of it. But a message came in tongues, and it said this. It said, this revival that I have poured out in this church will not end soon. 
that's on cue so far. And it said it won't end, uh, it won't end soon, and it said it will go on for a long time. And it said, son, talking to me, I want to give you comfort. It said, before you have a need, I'll already have the answer in the pipeline on the way to you. Before you even know what to ask for, I'll have the answer en route to you. And friend, I want to tell you something. If you're here tonight and you're a pastor and you're hungry for God and you're going after God but you're afraid, let me give you some peace. When I heard that prophecy that day, it warmed my heart, but I had to test it and prove that prophecy. After 714 services, I can stand here before you tonight and tell you, God has been faithful. Before I even knew what the need was, before I could even identify it good, I just saw something coming. But before I could even focus in on it and identify it real good, the answer was on the tail end of it. And God has been marvelous. And the second thing that the Lord said to us the first week of revival was, I am now pouring out my spirit among my people and introducing them to my son so that they will know him. So when they see him at the meeting in the air, they'll need no introduction. They will already know him. <laughs> Hallelujah. And friend, let me tell you, God has done just that. You may hear of shaking. You may hear of jerking. You may hear of deep bowing. You may hear of all those things. None of those things move me. I don't care if you shake like a leaf in the wind. I don't care if you deep bow from here to your car in the parking lot. That's not going to impress me. Only you know whether or not that's real. And like I told Brownsville the first week that revival broke out, if you fake it, revival's over for you right there because you sold out and you didn't hold out for the real thing. And there's going to be some that will never have any kind of a manifestation like that, but God will ignite their heart and warm their heart and give them a steadfast resoluteness to serve him. And they may never jerk or deep bow or shake, but they made up their mind they're going all the way with God. So I want to tell you, we've been in this thing long enough that anything you do here is not going to surprise us. It is not going to impress us. I just want to make sure while you're here that you get something that you know is real. This thing is being pastored. There's not a demon in a hundred foot of this sanctuary. There's not a demon in here. It's been swept. It's been garnished. It's been prayed over. The blood's been pled. We've had hundreds of communion services in here. Prayer was going on last night before this conference ever started. There was intercessors back there tonight behind the curtain in the baptistry interceding while the banners were coming out. You've already felt God. So there's no demons in here. And if there is, we will deal with them. Trust me, we will deal with them. And we will deal with the flesh. If something is really distracting, we'll deal with the flesh. But whatever you do while you're in Brownsville Assembly in Pensacola, Florida, leave your religion at the door and leave your pride at the door and come in and be hungry for God and God will touch you. I am so looking forward to this part of the service. We have um, quite a few different speakers for this conference. It's good to see David Ravenhill with us. He's here. He'll be speaking in the conference, and I'm not going to mention all the other speakers that'll be with us. But one of them that uh, we've just grown to love is Dick Rubin, who's a Messianic Jew, a saved biker. And uh, I'll never forget hearing, this is before I'd seen it, 
hearing about the golden altar. I heard so many people from Brownsville talk to me about the golden altar and how Dick has a way of presenting it through the Old Testament typology to where you can get a grasp on the, um, on the, the symbolism. And uh, in just a minute, Dick Rubin's going to come and he's going uh, to take this pulpit and he's going to lead us through something, friend, and this is going to be so precious to every one of us in this room. But before he comes, and I know he'll probably repeat what I'm saying, this, the, the items that he brings out here are just tools to um, relay a message. It's like the banners. The banners are not, there's nothing in the banners, and there's nothing in the golden altar uh, as far as, it's just symbolism, and it helps us to understand the truth of the word. How many believe those banners could help you pray? And I know, you know, some of you, be, be careful. Some of you, God may be speaking to you about using banners. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure God's speaking to you. But it does, you know, it helps people focus. And what Dick Rubin is about to do is going to help us all focus on, on suffering, on some of the things that we've gone through. And uh, Dick has been on the road. He travels all over the world right now, preaching the gospel, spreading revival. But I'm glad he's here with us tonight. Would you welcome Dick Rubin? How do you enjoy it so far? I just want to share some things. There's so many things that have been said tonight that I want to share. They'll bring out the golden altar. Now, as they move this paraphernalia, I've heard Steve say so many times, haven't you ever seen chairs move before? Haven't you ever seen a golden altar move before? <laughs> now, is that a parade or is that a parade? I love a parade. Isn't that something? Give him a hand, man. This is great, man. Yeah. I just want to share with you a couple of things that uh, are on my heart. Uh, Lyndall gave part of the message tonight already about this is a house of prayer. And what we see in the natural is always what God does in the spiritual. And the visual aids that God gave us in the Old Testament are just that to us. It was the law that there was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. So don't walk out of here saying, well, I've got to get a golden altar and I've got to burn incense and whatever. Friend, this is just a demonstration. The visual is so powerful that 60 to 70 percent of what you see you retain, but only about 10 percent or less of what you hear do you retain. How many know that God's interested in what we retain in our heart? It's the engrafted word. Can you say amen? amen. Instead of just a show. And I just, I, I really felt in my heart to, to talk to those, and, and, and I watch. I've learned this from, from Brother Steve. Brother Steve has been such a, an instrument placed in my life. We're not here much, haven't been here for probably the last three or four months, because we have. God has opened up the world to us. And we know that this revival that's coming is just not for America, friends. This is for the whole world. And I, I don't Pastor Kilpatrick probably remembers this. About four months ago, I told him, I said, I really feel like that something was going to change in the revival, that you're going to begin to see less domestic attraction and more international attraction because revival is sweeping America right now, friends. And God is going to begin to draw the world here. I remember several times I've heard Steve say, well, we're after 250 million people in America. Friends, I'm going to tell you, this revival is not after 250 million anymore. It's after 5 billion souls in the world. That's what it's after, the five billion hungry souls that need Jesus, even though they might not know that. So if you'll just rest this week, you'll receive. But if you're restless, there's going to be a resistance to receiving what God has for you. I want everyone to stand up for just a moment. I want you to tell the devil, I said, devil, I'm going to rest in Jesus. Now sit down and rest just that simple. When we strive, we miss what God wants to do. It builds up a resistance. It's like we've found so many times when we pray for people, and listen, I'm Pentecostal right down to my shoes. 
But when we pray for you, we're going to be praying for you tonight, the ones that want prayer tonight, we're going to be praying for you. But when you pray, if you just rest, you receive. But when you try to do all of these other things, and I, I understand what agreeing in prayer is, I understand that principle and that process, but this is your night. I saw a couple of weeks ago, we were here, we just had a Sunday off, and I came in and, and uh, Don Wilkerson was here, and he did something, I, it, just, it just blew me away. He put a handkerchief in his neck, and, and it hung down like a bib affair, and he said, you know, that's the way most Christians come to church. And then he took that, that, that handkerchief and folded it and laid it across his arm. He said, but that's what we are to be, servants. And friends, that's what we are here at Brownsville. We're your servants. Whatever your need is this week, we're your servants. Rest in the Lord and receive what he has for you. Many of you have made sacrifices to get here. Don't resist what God wants to do. Just rest and say, God, more, more, Lord, more, Lord. And I guarantee you it's going to happen. Amen. This particular uh, service that we are doing tonight was one of the foundational, corporate foundational truths that Pastor Kilpatrick, and here again, I wish he wasn't here because I don't want him to feel like I'm building him up and I'm not building Pastor up, but he's a visionary. When he sees something and he knows it's God, he's willing to be bold enough to say, I don't care what people think, I'm going to do it. And it happens. It's time that we quit monkey see, monkey do kind of stuff and to realize that if God speaks to you, why not do it? Are you willing to please men or God? And one of the things in the five, in the five nights we were here, one of the things that we taught, of course, was the golden altar. It's a very phenomenal presentation. The tape is out there if you want that. Anybody want this tape? Who wants this tape? Here you go. God bless you, brother. Cheers. Got to be fast. In the Old Testament typology, and that's what we have today out of the Old Testament, is typology. People try to stretch typology many times and really miss the whole meaning of what God wants to do. I believe that there's a pattern for revival. When the pattern is right, the glory falls. You cannot withhold the glory or the presence of God from a people that are crying out to God for his presence. God wants his, God wants his presence manifested among men more than men desire God's presence manifested among them. He created you so that he could have fellowship with you. If revival, and I remember reading in one of the publications, uh, I don't know, I've read so much about revival because I didn't understand much about revival. I still don't understand much about revival. Except it's nothing more than the simplicity of God coming down to be with man. His glory cloud coming down to, to clothe his people. There's not one in this room that God doesn't love. There's not one of you in this room that if you were the only one on earth and you were a sinner, that Jesus would have just come just for you. You're handpicked by God to be here tonight. You're not here by accident. Some of you have come for thousands and thousands of miles, and, 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 and I'll guarantee you that in this service, and I watch, and this is one of the things that I've learned from Brother Steve Hill, is watch the people. There's some of you, friends, that are so bound, and you don't need to be bound. Jesus came to set the captives free. And being a pastor, if you're bound, your congregation is going to be bound. If you'll get set free, your congregation will be set free. It's just part of God's process. He wants to be with you. He, he loves you. He, he, he gave his life. He gave his son's life for you. His blood was poured out at Calvary for you so that you could be here tonight and receive. For those of you that are burned out, you don't have to go home burned out anymore. You can go home, but you won't be burned out. You'll have a fire burning inside of you that nothing can put out, and you don't care what man thinks about you anymore. You're going for God, and that's all God wants is seek his faith with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul. That's what God created you for, and he sets you in a position over people to lead them into his presence also. Don't resist what God wants to do for you this week. Please. Tonight, we're going to share on the golden altar. In the Old Testament, we have a lot of typology. As I said before, many times typology is stretched almost to fiction. We try not to do that. 
But God gives the natural to reveal the spiritual. David saw the glory of God by looking at the sun, the moon, the stars. He said, thy heavens, he said, reveal your glory, O God. He was taking the natural, what he could see, the visual, and he could see the glory of God in it. Man became, and many times we've heard this message about the wickedness of the days of Noah. God repented that he had made man. And after he destroyed that evil and wicked generation and only saved Noah and his family, he set a bow in the sky that every time you look at a rainbow, you should look at the covenant that God has with earth. It's the visual revealing God. And this is one of the things that's happened to the church. We've turned away from God's plan and turned to our own ways. You see, man has a tendency to do what's right in his own eyes and calls it righteousness. We live in a sin-sick society at this present time because man wants to do what's right in his own eyes. Friends, we have exactly contained in what we call the Holy Bible everything that God asks of us. It's not grievous to serve him. It's a joy to serve him. But he gives us patterns. He gives us plans. And in his patterning, he always sets the pattern in the Old Testament to bring forth the wonderful fullness of his glory in the New Testament. God uses the natural to reveal the spiritual. Try to comply with God's command as often as you do this without having bread and a cup. It's an impossibility. So why is it that we want to resist the patterns that God gave to us and say, well, I'm going to do it my way. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but these are the ways of death. And one of the things that, that, that I feel very strongly is that, that, that as we came to Brownsville, and Brownsville has been a real testing ground for me and many others, is that there was a pattern given for revival, a series of things in these patterns, and it brought revival two and a half years later. I remember Pastor Kilpatrick, in, in, in particularly one of the messages, he said he never heard any message that ever touched his heart. It's about the, our great high priest. So there are patterns to revival. And one of the things that will break that pattern is S-I-N, sin. It broke the pattern of God's glory with, with Adam. Adam had it made. Only thing that God asked Adam, he said, don't touch that tree that's in the midst of the garden. And when he did, he sinned and the glory of God lifted. Until God once again established his glory cloud upon man in the tabernacle of Moses. The tabernacle of Moses, everything that I find in the New Testament that is in principle and type in the New Testament was first established in the tabernacle of Moses. There were pieces of furniture that were in the tabernacle of Moses that were used for specific things. One is the golden altar. What is the golden altar? It's just an instrument where man came to offer incense before God. You see, we've got a table of incense out in, out in the... I don't know what you call that, the tent. If you want to go to the table of incense tomorrow to buy some incense, we have incense there. It's called praise and worship. Probably one of the most gifted musicians I've ever met in my life, Lyndall Cooley, and I know there are other gifted musicians also. But he knows how to begin to offer incense before God. And every time you put one of those CDs on, you're burning incense under the Lord. We forget the process that God gave to man in offering incense. A simple thing, an altar where incense is placed. And always notice that the incense always goes to heaven, except where there's a strong wind in a sanctuary like this. <laughs> Friends, we've got to come back to the patterns that God has for us. We came back to, uh, just only several days ago from Israel. And I'm going to tell you how close we are to the coming of the Messiah. For the first time, and I've been to Israel many times, for the first time on the Temple Mount, I saw a Hasidic rabbi walking across the Temple Mount. Hasidic rabbis don't go to the Temple Mount, friends. It was almost as if he was pacing that off, looking for the time that they're going to lay the foundation for the third temple. 
He was walking, every, his stride wasn't broken. He was walking across the Temple Mount, and it looked to me like he was pacing something off. Friends, we are close, extremely close to the coming of the Messiah. But he's only going to come for those that are ready for the sound of the shofar. Tonight I heard my protege, I guess you'd say my fellow that filled my shoes, Scott Brown, to sound the shofar. We worked with him and he caught on to this thing about the shofar. Now he's blessed. It seemed like everywhere we go, we lay the footprints or the foundations for something that God wants to build. And then it's time to move on and do more. Yes, I enjoyed being at the revival, but it was time to go. It was time to lay patterns elsewhere that God could use if the people would only open their hearts and receive it. There are patterns for revival. When the pattern's right, the glory falls. And let me say this. Don't ever take for granted the presence of the living God. Never. Because as quick as the anointing falls, the anointing can be lifted. And that's what Brother Steve Hill was saying a little while ago. When, when you come through the door here, you just cry out to God, God, will you do it one more time? Holy Spirit, show up one more time. And I've seen the glory so heavy in this sanctuary that these lights were covered with a blue haze. And that the smell of incense was going back in the halls and in, into the television department. Friends, it wasn't just one person that saw that. It was a multitude. Because God said, he said, this house shall be a house of prayer. You see, Jesus had to cleanse the temple twice. The first time that he cleansed the temple, he accused them of being a house of merchandise. And we've got to remove the church from this merchandising mess that's going on and just get back to the simplicity of praying before God and crying out before God and worshiping God and offering incense upon him and stop worrying about this nonsense that we've called church for so long. I'm telling you the truth, friends. These are things that are burning in my heart right now. Jesus is coming soon, not just a figment of a person's imagination, not just saying it one more time as it's been said for almost 2,000 years. But friends, when you see that Hasidic rabbi walking across a defiled temple where there's a, 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 an idolatrous worship place called, called the Dome of the Rock, something's happening and you better wake up. And God wants to saturate this nation with revival. Thank God that he picked a place where he could find a pastor that was a visionary that could grasp the teaching of the, of the roots of, of typology. And thank God for, a, for an evangelist that God sent at just the right time to begin to, to harvest the wheat. But he wants to do it in your congregation. You can tell the devil to take his junk and get out of your life tonight because I'm telling you the revival is coming to America and he wants you right in the midst of it, of what God's going to do. We just came back not long ago from a place called Wollongong. Anybody ever heard of Wollongong? Hey! Wollongong in the aboriginal tongue means the valley of the dragon, the land of the snakes. So that's where God sends me. The largest Buddhist temple in the southern hemisphere was only about three miles from where we were. It's your witchcraft uh, capital of the southern hemisphere. Man, we tweaked the devil bad. We did him some severe damage, man. We blew the shofar and all of these British who were, you, know, you see Australia is part of the British Commonwealth and they have this stiff upper lip act, you know. Kind of little thing like this. I'm telling you, after the first night, I said, Dear God, I'm here for a week or so, and I've got to put up with that. I turned to the choir the second night there, and I said, Now! And the whole choir went down and began to flop. Now, is that right? You were there. You were there. And I turned over and said something to the, to, to the uh, orchestra, and I said, Now! And down they went, flopping. And all these people got all set free because they said, Well, it must not be too bad at all. And they began to dance and they began to rejoice, and the glory of God fell. And people now are coming to Wollongong from all around the Southern Hemisphere just to enjoy God, the same as they have for Brownsville, and the same that God wants to use your church for. 
Don't be discouraged, brothers and sisters. Don't be discouraged by the devil. Tweak the devil's tail and tell him who's in charge. You're in charge. He's not in charge. He's a loser. Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. But first, when Jesus goes to the temple the first time, John chapter 2, verse 16, he said, it's a house of merchandise. It's time we clear out this atmosphere of merchandising and just come back to the reality of Jesus. We don't understand anything, but I love you. I just love you with all my heart, Jesus. And begin to openly cry and begin to express yourself. Just as that incense is going up, that's exactly when you begin to love Jesus, it goes right into his nostril and it becomes a sweet savor unto him. The second time he cleansed the temple just before his death, he called it a house of prayer. First and foremost, our highest service or call as a Christian is our prayer life, our praise, our worship, and our intercession. That's why when we look at the, in fact, let's go to, let's go over to Exodus chapter 30 and look at the pattern for this altar. Patterns are important. Please never throw it out and say everything happens by random chance. It doesn't. It happens by pattern. Exodus chapter 30, we find the command given to Moses, Thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, of sheet and wood thou shalt make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, a cubit and the breadth thereof, four square shall it be, two cubits shall be the height thereof, the horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, the sides thereof, round about of the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. Now there were only two golden rings, not four. Two golden rings on the golden altar, two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it by the two corners thereof, and we'll tell you why in just a moment. The two sides of it thou shalt make it, thou shalt have it for places for the staves to bear it withal, and thou shalt make the staves of sheet and wood and overlay them with gold. Thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I'll meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning and dress the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. That was at nine o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon, the same time the sacrifice is nine o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it. It is a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Perpetual means continually. How often are we to praise God? Continually. You see, the pattern never changes. God never changes his pattern. This is something that the church has missed. It said, well, we're not under the law. I never said you were under the law, but God's patterns are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God changes anything in pattern in the Old Testament, when he comes to the New Testament, then God has lied to us because he said, I change not. The patterns are there. You see, if you just hold on to the New Testament and don't look at the patterns of God, you're going to have to throw out your pianos. You're going to have to throw out your choirs. You're going to have to throw out drums. You're going to have to throw out all of your musical instruments. Why? It's not mentioned in the New Testament. Why? Because God so thoroughly established the pattern in the Old Testament. Why should he change? He doesn't. He took the law and he nailed the 613 ordinances to the cross, but he never nailed the Decalogue to the cross. And that's what I like, even though Steve Hill doesn't understand what he's doing. I understand it more now that in the last three months, God has been birthing different messages in my heart. And one is that we've been raising backsliders in the churches. Somewhere about 80 to 90 percent of those that come to altars at churches aren't there a year later. Why? Because we preach the wrong message. What is sin? Sin is a transgression of God's law. We don't preach the law. You see, the law reveals our sin. Paul said, I would have never seen sin except it be by the law. And then when sin is realized and we understand our sin sick condition against God's standards, or in conjunction with God's standard or his standards revealing our sin sickness, then we turn them to, to, to grace to heal the sin. We've missed this thing about the law. We've gotten so afraid of the law. We've gotten so afraid of typology that we've thrown the pattern away and say, well, I'm going to do whatever I think is right. That's why we have all the denominations that we have today. Every denomination is started out of rebellion. Because man wanted to do what was right in his own eyes and not what was right according to God's Word. Now, if that affects you, then just study your history of denomination, divisions, and etc., whatever. 
People laugh at us because we're so divided over little tiny things that don't mean a hill of beans to start off with. And the thing that this revival is doing, it is bringing the body together. It is bringing unity in the body of Christ. That's what this revival is doing. You meet people that they say, well, I'm a Catholic. Not here, you don't. I'm just a believer. I just love Jesus. Hi, my sister. Hi, my brother. Isn't that what it was about? Didn't Jesus, in the last prayer that Jesus said, when he, when he said, my house is a house of prayer, the last prayer that Jesus offers up is, Father, I pray that they be one as you and I are one. This is happening, friends. I've never seen anything like that. I'll guarantee you we could have it. We, one night, what, how many denominations were represented? Remember how many? Must 50 or 60, maybe 100? 60 denominations in here, all praising God, all worshiping God, all being one as the Word of God is said to be. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's interesting. Because the word, seek ye first the kingdom of God, the first word that you find in the word first, or that word first, is the Greek, to zedatech, meaning to worship. Worship first his kingdom. Get out of this merchandise realm and begin to seek him, and his glory will fall. The pattern is there in the tabernacle for something we call the altar of incense. There were two altars in the tabernacle. One was in the outer court. The outer court tabernacle uh, altar was for the sinner. But when you came into the holy place, then that altar was for the priest. We're all priests. We're a kingdom of priests. The Word of God definitely denotes we're a kingdom of priests. But we've become priests with a prayerless life. One of the things that I've learned from Brother Steve Hill is a great affection for Mr. Leonard Ravenhill. Never knew much about him. But I've bought every book that I can buy I've read everything that he's ever written. Steve and Michael Brown were blessed to be under that ministry for a period of time in their life. I've thought so many times, Lord, I wish I would have met this man. This man had so much wisdom, not wisdom out of books, but wisdom from Almighty God. When the pattern's right, the glory falls. Leonard Ravenhill in his book, Revival Praying, in the chapter under prayerlessness is sin says, and I quote it, prayer is taxing. We don't want to be taxed anymore by prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I lay, wake, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. But what I had learned and have learned in Brownsville, prayer is many times agonizing. It's not just a simple prayer. It is, it, this is exactly when we begin to teach this series on the golden altar. That's what Pastor John Kilpatrick began to, to see was the need for prayer because here we can see the visual of what's really happening in the spiritual. How many of you, and I wouldn't ask for a raise of hands, but how many of you in here tonight have, have, have prayed and felt like your prayer didn't get any higher than the floor? He always hears your prayers, friends. He never turns a deaf ear. Just as that incense goes up, so does our prayers go up. Leonard Ravenhill also goes on to say, and I quote, we may call prayerlessness neglect or lack of spiritual appetite or loss of vision, but that which matters is what God calls it. Leonard Ravenhill cites 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, and it says this, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. I never will forget the first time that Michael Brown taught a session. You remember that? And he talked about the worst sin that we as Christians have is our prayerless lifestyle. I remember sitting in the pastor's lounge, and I cried, and I said, Michael, I said, I said, that drove an arrow right through my heart. You see, if you take five minutes of watching television, you could spend five minutes praying and change a nation. We've missed this thing because we've thrown the pattern out for prayer, and we pray generally very selfishly. God, give me this. God, give me that. I 
I was in Israel and I heard this pastor tell the story only a few weeks ago about how he went fishing and there were several men in the boat and there was a dog, they had a puppy and it fell overboard. Well, instead of getting the puppy out, they kept hitting the puppy with the oar and pushing the puppy under. And this pastor said he got an oar and began to push the puppy down. It was great fun watching the puppy struggle for his life. And he said every time the puppy came up to get a gasp of air, they just took the paddle and pushed him down again and laughed. And I found myself with tears in my eyes thinking about the cruelty that these men were inflicting on this little innocent animal. But the punchline was this. He said, you cried over that, but do you cry as much for a soul? Do you cry as much for a soul? Prayerlessness is sin. It's not seeking first the kingdom. God wants to bring us to a new level. Brownsville seems to be a prototype in so many areas, but it doesn't have all the answers because people here are still trying to figure out, Lord, what makes this thing tick? It's almost like God is a mystery. And every night you come in here, you've got to get in touch with God and not rely on yesterday's experience. The priest, when he walked into the tabernacle and he trimmed the lamps, he took the wick that was yesterday's light and trimmed the wick and put it in a snuff dish and threw it away. See, we for too long have been trying to live off of our past. We have no past, friends. How many times we've heard it from this pulpit by Brother Steve Hill, all we have is a now. And now's the time to begin to move in prayer like we've never moved before and begin to understand that what we begin to see in the tabernacle of Moses and the golden altar is it is the highest piece of furniture that there was. Two cubits was the height. We read it a few moments ago. There was no other piece of furniture that was as high as this. The table of showbread was only half that height, one and a half cubits. Even the Ark of the Covenant of God, where God's glory dwelt, was only one and a half cubits. Our highest service is our prayer life. People are counting on you tonight. Your congregation is counting on you tonight. There's a time that you've got to forget self and stand between the porch and the altar and to begin to cry out to God for souls. Not just church. It's not time. We need to throw that terminology out. We're going to have church. Friends, we don't need to have church. We need to fall on our face in repentance before God and cry out as a nation that has turned their back on God and God will open his arm and say, I'll restore you. Come back unto me. It's a simple thing of offering incense before God. You don't have to pay a price for it. No one charges you for it. It's a heart's desire to run after God. And every time you begin to pray, you look at that incense and don't ever forget it. It's going up to God. No matter what it is, it's going up to him. His desire is that that souls be saved. His desire is greater than yours. He said, I would that none would perish. No, not one, but that all, how many? All would come to repentance. And you're the key. You're the key. And God's going to hold you responsible if you don't catch the vision of what God is doing in these last days. It's not just for Brownsville. I wish I could open my heart and show you what, 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 what's inside of me. And, 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 and you could feel my heart right now even as, it, as inside. It's, just, it's, just, it's, it, it's so full. It just wants to let you know you are important to God. You Every one of you, or you wouldn't be here. Don't resist what God wants to do in your life. The only function of the golden altar was to burn incense. That means to produce a cloud of incense. Clouds are so important. If you go back to, or over to Numbers for just a moment, Numbers chapter 9, you'll find that When the pattern was right, God sent his cloud of glory down upon the tabernacle. You find it in Numbers chapter 9. And the first thing it had to do with was communion, which speaks, I mean, it was with Passover, which speaks of communion. 
And that's another thing that we'll be teaching on Thursday morning and Thursday afternoon. Do you know how important the communion table is? That was another thing that Pastor picked up on, was the key to intimacy with Jesus. Do you know the last thing that Jesus did with his corporation, if you want to use that terminology, with his 12 disciples, the last thing he did before he suffered and died, he had communion. Or he established the communion table with the bread and the wine. Do you realize the first thing he did when he got out of the grave, he broke bread again. That's the importance that God places on these patterns. They're not just things that are just in the Bible. It's not just stuff in the Bible. And it says when the pattern was right in verse 15, Numbers chapter 9, and on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony, and even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. And it was always there. The cloud covered it by day, the appearance of fire by night. The same as that cloud of incense goes up, so was God's cloud of glory there with his people. There were those, and I can't prove it, and I shared this with, with a pastor that's here tonight. And, but it says that there were those that, who were the nation or the Hebrew nation or Israel that says that their bones were bleached in the sun, in the sand. You see, when the glory cloud moved on, if you didn't move, God's provisions were gone. And in your church, and one of the reasons that you're here tonight is the glory cloud is moving in your church, friends or you wouldn't be here, or God is preparing you for the move of that glory cloud, and you're going to have to move with the glory cloud. It doesn't make any difference, and no one goes with you. God will more than reestablish what you lose, and he'll give you a multiple back for what you lose. Don't be afraid. The fearful are the ones that go to hell. I don't say it. Acts, I mean, I mean, Revelation chapter 20 talks about that the fearful and the abominable. Friend, it's time that we quit fearing what man thinks and begin to worry more about what God thinks about our life. We're told that the, we're to offer a sacrifice of praise continually, Hebrews 13, 15. Now, I want to share something with you that, that, again, going back to the altar, and we can't do everything. If you want to go into an in-depth thing of this, get the tape. I don't have time to get into all this stuff tonight. But we're touching on just some things about the golden altar. Its height proves to us that our highest service to God is our prayer, praise, and worship, our intercession. You can't be called to a higher office. I don't care if it's president of the United States. I don't care if it's president of General Motors. Their office is never as high as you as a priest standing at an altar crying out to God for souls. There were only two rings. I stated that just a moment ago, one on each side. We've lost this art of intercession. We've lost the art of prayer. Why don't you go to Romans chapter 8 for just a moment? Romans chapter 8. Now, the two rings were the support of the altar. In other words, the altar speaks of our prayer life. The, the, the incense speaks of our prayers going before God. And the only way that this altar can be moved, in other words, the only way that your prayer life could be moved is you have to have two supports to your prayer life. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. They were rings, no beginning and no end. That's the significance of a ring. So there's something that supports our prayer life, that gives balance to our prayer life. We find it in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the first ring. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what she, we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. Who's making the intercession? The Spirit. With groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, the part that we miss is, and we've all been taught this, and well, meaningly, but we've only been taught half of the truth. And we pick it up in verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Now stick with me on this. I'm reading out of the King James. And it speaks about Jesus, who is even at the right hand of God, who what? Come on. Also maketh intercession for us. We've got two intercessors, friends. We got the Holy Ghost, and we've got Jesus. See, we miss that. I'm telling you, it's not a sin to be Pentecostal, it's necessary.
Why? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit in the speaking in tongues moves half of your prayer life. Every one of us in this room should be praying 50% in the Holy Ghost. And some of us who have the gift of the Holy Ghost don't spend more time than probably maybe 30 seconds or maybe a, 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 a minute in the month praying in the Holy Ghost. You should get up in the morning. I like it. What Steve Hill has said so many times, you get up and you start praying in the Holy Ghost, put a chauffeur beside your bed, sound that a couple times, go back to praying in the Holy Ghost, and the devil's going to say, my God, he's awake again. I do have a shofar. Drives a lot of people nuts. <laughs> Friend, you'd be surprised how that devil will bow to your authority. We don't realize that. The devil's got a hold of some of you in here and got your mind so twisted you're depressed. But all you got to do is begin to offer a little incense. No, shut up, shut up, shut up. No, take that one, devil. Take it, take it. Almost lost this expensive microphone. There were two rings that support the golden altar. There's two supports to your prayer life. Holy Spirit and Jesus sitting to the right hand of the Father who also maketh intercession for you. Rings were the support or the movement of the altar. So is praying in the Holy Ghost and having Jesus make intercession for it. That's what moves our prayer life. You could not transport that altar in balance with only one ring. That's why our prayer life is, so, is, is, is in such a shambles is because we haven't learned the balance to prayer. If you say, well, do I have to speak in tongues? No, you get to. It's an awesome privilege, amen? Things are changing, friends. The church is never going to be the same. The church is growing more and more and more into the image of Christ. And when we see him, we shall be like him. I believe this, that some night here in Brownsville, they're going to be praising God, and all of a sudden Jesus is going to show up. They're not going to see any earth anymore. They're going to be in the heavenly presence with the Lord, and it's going to happen in your congregation, and it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of a trump. You're going to be changed from mortality to immortality. Altar speaks of our prayer life. Two intercessory supports. What is it that Jesus looks for when he returns? Luke chapter 18. Will he find faith on the earth? I believe we're about ready to enter into a faith realm of believers that we've never entered into before. And that faith is going to produce the signs and the wonders and the miracles that are going to convince, that Je convince the sinner that Jesus is Lord. You see, the signs, the wonders, and the miracles will convince the sinner that Jesus is Lord. I believe this with all my heart. When we understand what the golden altar is all about and understand why we, and we're going to talk about the crushings here in just a moment, understand what's happening in our life and why our life sometimes is, 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 is almost rendered to a, a point of uselessness. You feel like you can't do anything anymore. Friends, good, because in your weakness are you made strong. Luke chapter 18, verse 8. Will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he comes? What is Jesus doing sitting at the right hand of the Father? How, does the, how do these two rings come into play and understand what is the Holy Spirit doing with the intercession and Jesus doing the intercession also? It's very simple. While we're there in Luke, Luke chapter 22. In verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But Jesus said, I have prayed for thee, that your faith doesn't fail. I believe this with all my heart. God is not sitting at the right hand. I mean, Jesus is not sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for you a new Cadillac. He's praying that your faith doesn't fail. That's his intercession. Now, on the other side of the coin, I want to go to the book of Jude for just a moment. In verse 20, 
But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, how? Praying in the Holy Ghost. So what are we doing? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and for me that our faith doesn't fail because he's going to look for faith when he returns on the earth. And when we begin to pray in the Spirit, our faith is being built. You see, the devil fears that because he can't touch you when you're walking in the realm of faith. There's a new level coming, and I don't know when it's going to come, but I've seen it in the Spirit. There is a fresh wave of this anointing that's coming, and it's going to be so deep, just like there were four levels of water from the throne of God it in uh, Ezekiel chapter 47. It was to the ankles, then to the knees, then to the loins, and water so deep that we had to swim. It was a flood. Word of God says that in the last days it says the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's what we're about, ready to enter, friend, and we're going to have to move in the power of prayer and in the power of intercession. <coughs> what moves our prayer life? Praying in the Holy Ghost, just like Paul says. I pray with the Spirit. I pray with my understanding. I sing in the Spirit. I sing with my understanding. The time is kind of of an essence tonight, but I want to go to Psalm 141. We'll finish up here in just a moment. We want everyone to have a chance. I don't care what your problem is tonight, friends. We're going to send it up to the heavens in smoke. Going to go right through the devil's bedroom. I like it. Chaplain Robinson alerted me that time. He said, isn't it nice whenever you blow the shofar, you have to go right through his bedroom because you see he's in the second heaven. You go up to the third heaven with that. I love it, man. When, I, when we used to do Tuesday night prayer sessions here, friends, I loved it. I got to the point, it just became addictive to me. I love to do his kingdom damage because I know I can and you can. Every one of you in here can do damage to the devil and you need to go back and take back what the devil's stolen from you. I don't know where we go with this thing. Psalm 141, wonder where we're going? David lets us know that incense has to do with our prayer and what the sacrifice of praise is. Psalm 141. David says, Lord, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me, give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set before thee as incense. And the lifting of my hands as an evening sacrifice. You see, we've looked at this idea for so long that when it talks about to offer the sacrifice of praise, that we're going to offer praise when we don't want to. Friend, show me anywhere in the Word of God that God receives anything from man that man does not freely, willingly give to him. It's not there. What is the sacrifice of praise? It has a lot to do with the lifting of the hands. Now, in the Old Testament, it's still being taught in the Yeshiva Levim and Jerusalem, which is preparing the priests for the third temple times. Let's get a couple things off here for you. Because there was a handheld censer. And I want you to go to Leviticus chapter 16 and we'll see that handheld censer. It wasn't on a chain like some people would have you believe. It was a handheld censer. Leviticus chapter 16 tells how the priest had to enter into the Holy of Holies. I don't know about you. I just don't want an outer court experience with God. I want a Holy of Holies experience with God. There were three levels of priest in the Old Testament. There was the priest, the, what we call the Levaim, which were the Levites, the workers. There were the Kohanim, or the Gadah Kohanim, which were the priest and the high priest. See, there are three levels that you'll function in, in your maturity in the body of Christ. There are those that bring forth 30-fold harvest and those that bring forth 60-fold and those that bring forth 100-fold. I don't know about you, but I want to be a 100-fold person before God. I want to give him what makes him happy. How many times I've heard Brother Steve Hill talk about, a, about this thing about a crown. He wants a crown so big that, 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 that it's the most glorious crown that's ever seen in heaven. We well, see, I want that too. And I know that you do. 
I don't want to hang out in the outer court. It's too hot out there. It stinks. All the blood and guts from all the animals. I don't want that. I want to come into the presence of the glory of God and just bask in the presence of the glory of God. And that's exactly what we have done here for so many nights. It's just basking. It's just sitting here. God, it is real, isn't it? Just the rest. Just, ju just the feeling that he's so close that you can reach out and kiss him. And that's what he wants. That's what he desires. He wants that fellowship. David says, let my prayer be set before thee as incense and the lifting of my hands as an evening sacrifice. Well, we find the counterpart going over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, maybe. Right church, wrong view. Huh? First Timothy what? Chapter 2. Still, right string, wrong yo-yo. Somewhere it is there. I know it's there. I read it. Yeah, verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. Thank you, Michael. What does David say? The lifting of my hands as an evening sacrifice and my prayer or my praise is set before thee as incense. Now notice what Paul says. See, God never changes his pattern. He said, I will therefore that men everywhere pray, lifting up what? Holy hands without wrath and doubting. Praying and lifting hands. Praying and lifting hands. The evening sacrifice. That's the sacrifice of praise, friends. Let me show you something here. This is still being taught. We just came back from the Temple Institute. This is what's being taught to the Levites who are preparing for the third temple. That there was a handheld censer and that incense was placed upon the coals in the censer. And as they begin to minister to the Lord, you remember they had to cross the veil. How did they get through the veil? It's being taught in some of the Jewish writings, in the Mishnic writings especially, that it was supernatural. That as the priest would lift that incense before God and press himself against the veil, that he was taken supernaturally into the Holy of Holies. That's what the lifting of our hands does. Have you ever noticed in praise and worship how you seem to sometimes just, just, be, just be withheld from that, from that presence, but you begin to lift your hands and totally abandon yourself and offer that praise. My prayer and my praise is set before thee as incense, and the lifting of my hands is an evening sacrifice, and all of a sudden God takes us one step behind the veil into his presence. These are principles that we can see in the natural so that we understand what happens in the spiritual. God wants us to have that Holy of Holies experience. David said it of a people who would offer incense, Psalm 102. Psalm 102, he said that there would be a people yet to be created that shall praise God. He wasn't talking of his generation. I believe he was speaking of the church. In verse 13, thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, Psalm 102, for the set time to favor her, yea, the set time has come, for thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. And it says, when the Lord shall build up Zion, then he shall appear in his glory. Verse 18, David says, for this shall be written for the generation to come and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. That's you, friends. God gave us a pattern. The highest order of service, our prayer, our praise, our worship. Leonard Ravenhill said it best, our prayerlessness is sin before God. Well, he doesn't hear my prayers. Wrong. That incense always goes up, and it always is a sweet fragrance before God. If you get your prayer life right and, 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 and order your priorities right, where you don't ask everything for yourself, but begin to worry about people other than yourself. God will take care of you. That's what happened when these foundations were laid here. This is what Pastor John Kilpatrick saw. He saw the need to begin. I, I remember come, every time I came through town, I always tried to call Brother Kilpatrick and say hi. And the first thing he'd say, you got your golden altar with you. 
Remember that? Always wanted this golden altar. Why? Because it was speaking to him. It was speaking to his spirit. Even though he might not have understood it, it was speaking to his spirit about the depth of praise and worship that he was yet to experience. But when he experienced it, the glory of God fell. Incense creates a cloud of fragrance. Clouds are always associated with the glory of God. Numbers chapter 9, verse 15 through 17. God's glory is associated with a cloud, and the word in the Hebrew for cloud is anon. God warns the nation of Israel not to come upon Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19. Moses was intimate with God face to face, Deuteronomy chapter 34, 10. But the Lord is intimate with Moses in the midst of a cloud. How did the priest get through that, that, that veil? Well, he went through four times, but once he got through the veil, he could come back and forth in, in, in the presence of that incense. That's why many times when you're praising God and then all of a sudden exuberance bre breaks out, why? You, become back, you come back on the other side of the veil. Once you create that atmosphere of the incense, you can go in the presence of God on the Holy of Holies and come out and rejoice and go back in the presence of God and come out and rejoice. There's free access. You flow in the cloud of incense. I started to go to Leviticus chapter 16 because now I want to talk for just a moment. And we're going to move on to something else. There's so much we can teach. There's such a rich treasure in understanding the altar of incense. But Levitic, Leviticus chapter 16, we have the day on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, when the priest would enter in to the Holy of Holies. Now, there is a specific pattern we find in verse 12. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Now that word beaten small means crushed. You see, the resins that are, that are retrieved or taken from certain types of trees in the Middle East that the incense is made from, many times you'll find pieces of incense that are as big as a golf ball. I may have some here. I think I set some. Here's a piece of frankincense. You can see how large it is right here. It's a piece of frankincense. But it says it had to be beaten small. Now it begins to apply to us personally. Because many of us go through the grindings of and the battles and the fiery trials that the devil throws in our face. And many times we cry out to God, God, don't you care about us? Yes. It's time to grow. Time to grow. You never grow, friends, unless you're stretched. And you get stretched in the fiery trials. But there's got to be a crushing that takes place in each of our lives so that we can be used of God. That's what I want to deal with now. But it, so let's finish, finish up in verse 13. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. You know, I just happened to think of something. I'm going to go over here. I'm, I want to go over to, uh, to show how intense things happen in the Old Testament. Uh, in Exodus chapter 20, I like this. Moses was in the presence of God, and God gives him the law. But in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 18, and it says, All the people saw the thunderings, the visual, and they saw the lightnings. But this is interesting. They saw the noise of the shofar. The shofar was so intense they could see the noise. And it says, and they saw the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. I can understand the lightnings. I can see that. I can understand the thunderings. I can, I can understand seeing the smoke, but I can't understand seeing the sound of the shofar. And this is another thing that God is bringing back. Tonight, we're going to sound the shofar right in the midst of this incense that's going up, and we are going to mess up the devil's week. And you're going to get set free tonight. You're not going to carry this baggage anymore. It doesn't belong to you. 
It belongs to the devil. The power of the incense is what I want to look at now. Because it's going back to Leviticus chapter 16, he shall take a censer full of burning coals of the fire off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, crushed. And he has to bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony. See, as that cloud of incense was offered up, God's cloud of glory came down. And this is what he wants tonight. He wants all heaven to come down in your life tonight, friends. You're not going back to your motel the same. I don't even know how you're going to get back to your motel, some of you. The power of God is going to come down in this place tonight. I guarantee it, friends. And if you've never been to one of these conferences, it's going to probably mess up your mind for a period of time if you don't rest and let God. If you'll rest, you'll receive. If you resist, you're not going to receive anything from God. Restlessness means to resist. In the Jewish writings of the Zohar, it is explained that the cloud was a necessary component for God's revelation to occur. I don't know about you, but many times I can be in worship services when the power of God, you can just feel the presence of God in the worship, and the revelation begins to pop just like this, one right after the other. Why? Because it is the cloud, that cloud of that glory that's around you that you don't hear from man, you hear from God. Cloud of incense. In the Hebrew, it's Adon HaKetereth. The cloud covering gave Moses access to God. It gave the priest access to God also. Now, I want to look at the incense. We're going to complete this tonight, teaching a little bit of teaching that we've done here tonight, Exodus chapter 30, because you see the golden altar was really not able to function without incense. That was the reason it was created. Exodus chapter 30. Remember, it had to be beaten small. Keep that in your mind. Now we have the ingredients for the incense, Exodus chapter 30, verse 34. The Lord said unto Moses, take unto these sweet spices. Number one, stacta. Number two, anica. Number three, gabanum. These sweet spices with pure frankincense of each, there shall be a like weight. Four, four incenses, or four resins. There was stacta, anica, gabanum, and frankincense. But it says in verse 35, thou shalt make it a, prefer, a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary. In other words, it must be ground and mixed, tempered or salted together, pure and holy. So there are really five ingredients to the incense. You have stacta, anica, gobanum, frankincense, but what brings it all together is salt. You see, we're the salt of the earth. We're the ones that bring these ingredients that God places in our life together so that we can offer a sweet fragrance to him. Now, if you look at the way that this incense was put together, the first thing that you would have to have stacked up. Where's my stack? Somebody left. Oh, I got it covered. Excuse me. Put a little stack. What is stack? Most of you folks, if you're from a southern state, you know that pine trees just have this sticky stuff called pine resin that just flows out of the tree. You see, that's the first sign that we should understand in the incense. If we are to offer up incense, our prayer is set before thee, our praise is set before thee as incense. The first ingredient of the incense then comes freely. Why is it that we have to beat people to get them to praise God? We should freely be praising God everywhere we go. I know people think I'm a nut, but man, I don't care if I'm in Walmart or Kmart. I'm just talking to the Lord all the time, just praising him and glorifying him. I don't care what people think of me anymore. I lost that two and a half years ago in this revival. I don't care. I don't know if I want to speak in tongue. 
Be right in the toy department, man, praising God in the Holy Ghost. Who cares? Who really cares? So out of our prayer life, the first ingredient that we see is that we should free spont. The, the spontaneity that's in our praise should just flow forth. No one asks for it. And so many times I see these things called praise and worship session where, come on, lift your hands, come on, dance. Friends, if you're happy, you're going to dance. Some of you folks wanted to dance tonight. I saw you. You wanted to, but you didn't know how to do it. What are they going to think of me? Who gives a rip what anybody thinks about you? It's what God thinks about you. Amen? Who cares? If God knows you, it doesn't make any difference who doesn't know you. And if God doesn't know you, it doesn't make any difference who does know you. Amen? So freely, we should give our praise and worship instead of having someone just beat us and say, come on, praise God. Well, I don't want to. We don't have to. When it should just be, Lord, can't wait to get into your presence with your people and just begin to praise you and glorify you, Lord. We'll ride with you. We'll do these things, oh God, that we sing about. Lord, we just love you. Some of these folks, man, they go this half mass kind of stuff, you know. I've heard Brother Steve Hill say, that's a, that's a shame. Hey, there I am. So what, devil? I, I'm telling you, the more I get into this thing about tweaking him, I just tweak him. I just I raise my hand. Take that one, devil. How do you like it? Take. You don't like that one, devil? Take two of them. Double portion. Double portion. Double portion. Next ingredient. <coughs> Friends, I'm liberated. You might not know that, but I am liberated. The next one thing that we have is Annika, part of a shellfish. Now, Annika, <clears throat> that shellfish crustacean that they, that they took from the Reed Sea, or the Yom Suf, as it's called, the Reed Sea. You call it the Red Sea, it's called the Reed Sea. Sometimes it was 400 feet deep. The only way you could get that crustacean is you had to let nets way down deep and snag those crustaceans to get them to the top. You see, out of our depth, God is looking out of our depth freely we should be giving our praise and our worship before him. Not this superficial stuff because somebody tells you to jump up and down and shout hallelujah. But deep down, man, when you, when you begin to feel it coming out, Lord, this is you. And then, and, and then when that feeling begins to come, guess what? You don't know anyone's around you. You're totally alone with God. You might be in the midst of 10,000 people, but you're totally alone with him. Lord, it's coming out of my midst now. Freely I give to you, God. You've given to me freely, and I give back to you that which you desire. You inhabit, you live in the praises of your people, you say. Third ingredient, Gabanum. Interesting about Gabanum. There's a bush in the Middle East that grows. It's a, in the myrtle bush family or myrtle, myrtle tree family that, that if you'll just take the limb and not break it, but just split it. And over the night, this resin begins to form in this, in this, in this break. And you go the next morning, you just take a sharp instrument and pick it off of the break where the, where the, the limbs have been separated. Now comes the hard part, because you see, out of our brokenness, from the depth of our very being, still freely, we should be worshiping God, no matter what happens. There's some of you here that can't get by that point. I watched you tonight. I felt it really in my spirit. But you wanted to worship the Lord so bad, but you had the burdens of the devil on you. I've come to tell you Jesus is going to set you free. You're not carrying anything out of here tonight anymore. I've fought the devil and fought the devil and every one of us here. He almost tried, tried to kill pastor, tried to kill me, burned out your secretaries. I don't know anybody in this revival that has not suffered severely at the hands of the devil. But greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Can you say amen? Give him praise, give him glory tonight for that. Amen. Now we come to frankincense. 
I want to share something with you. I want to show you something. Well, that's okay. We'll do something else. Put a couple pieces of frankincense in here. Frankincense is taken from a tree that is pierced in the afternoon as the sun goes down. And for some reason, they still don't know why, this resin, just before it's daylight, comes out of the piercing in that tree. That resin comes out of that, out of that tree just before daylight. How many of you ever walked the floor late at night and you're pierced and wounded? It always seems like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and you're crying out to God and say, God, are you real? Lord, I can't take it anymore. Are you real, Lord? I'm pierced, I'm wounded. You see, that's the frankincense that comes out. Out of our piercings, out of our brokenness, out of the very depth of our inner man, we should be freely giving to God glory and praise and worship, friends. When you understand what's happening, it helps you overcome what's happening because so many times we think, oh God, why is this happening to me? He said, I'm just preparing you as a sweet vessel unto me. Now remember, it takes salt to put all this thing together. We're the salt of the earth. We're the ones that are entrusted with all of this heartache, this pain, this piercing, and all of that stuff. Now I'm going to show you something here. Here's a piece of uh, frankincense. I can take the frankincense and put it right on the coal. Nothing happens. Why? Remember, it had to be beaten small. It had to be crushed. Remember, we read it in Leviticus chapter 16. So I want you to close your eyes. And I just want you to listen for just a moment. This is your night. We've tried to tell you this several times tonight, and I want to emphasize this, that this is your night. This is your week. This is the week that you're going to be transformed into something great. I believe with all my heart, you just didn't come to this conference just to sit and listen. You came to be changed by the living God. And you're going to see that there's a prayer that Steve leads every night of this revival. He's always led it. Jesus, speak to my heart and change my life. So here we have all of this incense together, but we can just see that the incense is just beginning to smolder now, and it was in a large piece. So this is the reason that the incense has to be rendered to powder. It must be crushed, or it cannot be used, because remember the command was that it had to be beaten small or crushed is the word in Hebrew. So after all of the ingredients are put in a mortar and pestle and they're ground, now comes the part that's so painful in our growth. Oh God, I'm going through crushings. Don't you care? Can't you hear my prayer, oh God, and understand that these crushings hurt? God says, yes, I understand. I sent my son to Gethsemane. He was crushed and pressed so much that blood came as though it were sweat out of his pores. I understand crushing. And my son and my daughter, I'm not crushing you to destroy you. I'm crushing you that you might be useful in my hand. And as you begin to get crushed more and more and more, and you think that you can't take any more, and it seemed like for a moment the, the crushing stopped, and... It's really only a time when the hand of God is looking at your condition. And he sees that you're not ground quite enough because, you see, he's the master. He knows he's done this for centuries to people. And so the crushing goes back, 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 crushing crushing you back to what 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 the lord what what you thought was was destruction god is bringing you back to him by crushing you remember the incense had to be beaten small and as an apothecary blends the ingredients of a prescription so god blends you with spontaneity and worship and brokenness piercings and out of the depth of your heart but one day the holy spirit looks says he's ready, Father. See, it took a little while, just I want you to open your eyes, it took a little while for one piece of large incense to begin to smolder. But when you're crushed, look what happens when you encounter the fiery trials of the devil. At the moment that it hits the coals, you burst into an instant fragrance before God. So you see, this is what God is trying to do in the crushings in our life. 
is to bring us to a point that it makes no difference what the devil throws in our face. We're worshiping him and praising him as a sweet incense into his nostrils. Lord, it makes no difference. What are they going to do? Burn me? What are they going to do? Feed me to the lions? Come on, lion. Instant death is instant glory. This is what God wants to do in our life, friends. And, and, and this is what I was saying earlier, that when we resist what God wants to do in our life, friends, God can't move. God is not trying to destroy you. God is causing you to mature and grow up. Tonight, we're going to have you come up in just a moment and begin to offer some of this incense before the Lord. And I don't care what your problem is. I want you to take this just as a, as a touchstone tonight and say, Devil, I don't care what you tell me. My God says that he came to set me free. And I'll tell you what, Devil. I'm going to send something right through your living room. I'm going to put it in a Holy Ghost mailbox and send it right to the Lord because he said, lay all your burdens on me. I care for you. How about that one, devil? Whoa. Yeah, that one hit you right in the corner post of your bed, didn't it? Let's do this one right under your bed. Here's all your burdens that you've laid on me, you nasty rascal. Now look at it going right up to the Father. Come here, Scott. You're so far. Friend, there's a powerful tool that God's given to the church. We've missed it. I don't care what you've got tonight on you. I don't care what it is. I want you to come up here tonight, and I just want you to take a little bit of incense and say, Devil, it's yours now. I don't have it. It's gone. I don't want it anymore. Now, we'd probably be criticized for this. I'm always criticized for this. I don't really care. What I care about is, is there a way you can be set free? Is there a way that I can point you a little closer to understanding how your burdens can be totally lifted? Look at that cloud of incense. Whoa. How about it, devil? Don't look up there for the devil. He's down here. Devil, how about it? Dear God, call out the fire extinguishers. We're not going to extinguish the Holy Ghost, amen? Now, what we want you to do in the balcony, we want you to come down either side, if you will. You're going to come up and put all uh, incense. The, the ushers are going to help you do this. And we're going to be worshiping and praising God. Remember, the lifting of your hands is an evening sacrifice. Until your time comes, we're going to begin to worship God. I don't know what's going to happen, friends. Maybe tonight's the night we all go home to be with Jesus. I don't know. But we're going to go in a cloud of incense. Amen? Come here, Scott. Get that microphone. Devil doesn't like this one either. You see... The shofar was sounded at the sacrifice at 3 o'clock in, in the afternoon, 9 o'clock in the morning. It was also sounded so that the people would know that incense was being offered up too. All of that happened at the same time. The altar of incense was burning, the lamps were trimmed, and the sacrifice was all together, 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Exodus chapter 29 talks about that. So we're going to wake up the devil let him know what's getting ready to happen. Are you ready? We're going to praise God, friends. We're going to lift the rafters off of this place tonight. Devil can't do anything to you anymore. You've come, and you're going to get set free. I want you to sound the shofar as you begin to come. Lendl, if you'll come and begin to praise God. What a gifted musician. What a wonderful man of God he is. And I don't mean to build him up, but I'm telling you, friends, he knows how to get a hold of God in lifting up that incense. That's why I said you can go to his table tomorrow and buy all the incense you want because praise and worship is that intercession, that inner incense that we're offering to the Lord. Shake up the devil. Wake him up. Let him know what we're doing. Yes. Come on. shout. Yep, you sure can. We're going to shout, friends. I love to mess up his day. I came here for one purpose, to mess him up severely. I want you to shout as loud as you can. We, where's the shofar? Don't run off my shofar. Do you know, listen, listen, listen to this now. 
Do you realize that the first instrument of praise, Psalm 150, says praise him with the trumpet? But if you read it in the Hebrew, it's praise him with the blast of the shofar. Why? Because the shofar opens up the heavens that our praise and our worship can go right through. David knew the key. So I want to sound that again, and I want you to shout for as long as you can and as loud as you can. I want you to mess up the devil. I want the hell to know what's going on up here in Brownsville tonight in Pensacola, Florida. Sound it, brother. Come on! I encourage you to come tonight. Whatever it is your problem is, I want you to lay it on this altar. And I want you to go back to your seat. I don't want you to leave the sanctuary. I want you to begin to praise God. Praise Him for all the things that He's done. The crushings in your life. You see, as you begin to come, you notice that as they put that little bit of incense, everybody puts what little bit they have. Notice the cloud beginning to form. You see, God says every one of you are important. If you'll put just what little bit you have on that altar, the glory of God is going to fill his house. The cloud of glory is going to fill his house. And when you leave here tonight, friends, I'll tell you this, you'll smell like incense. Why? Because you've been in the presence of God. Come, come, don't be ashamed tonight. Lay your burdens on the altar. Give it up tonight. This is your week. This is your week. Give it up. Give it up.
the sovereign God is upon us because he has anointed us to preach Lift your hands as an evening sacrifice. Your praise and worship is set before him as incense. He's a holy God. And without holiness, no man shall see God. Just worship him, saints. Just worship him. Worship him. Holy, 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 holy. Holy art thou, O Lord. Holy. Just worship him, saints. Jesus' name. Any weight of the devil on your shoulders, take it off tonight. Don't resist what he wants to do, saints. He loves you so much. But he said, I live and I inhabit the praises of my people. He lives there. Just worship him, saints. Just worship him.
Worship him. 